Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chief Content Officer Brad Behrens. Hello, hello. So, yeah. well, that was a little more subdued than yesterday. Is it possible that some of you might have gone to a party last night? If you went to a party last night, let's hear up it for the party. How good was your party? Okay, your parties sucked, I'm sorry. Either that or you're really hungover right now. Um, I'm thrilled to welcome you back. Can we put the slides up? We've got an incredible day for you. Let's get going right away. This is what it looked like as we were coming into this incredible show, this biggest show in digital advertising in the industry in the world. Right? That's just as we're getting ready for the show. We had some awesome keynotes yesterday. We had incredible press coverage. Thank you, members of the press, for letting the world know what we're doing. We had breakout sessions with fascinating, brilliant, and of course, very physically attractive people. We had engaged audiences, even more attractive than the speakers themselves. Guy Kawasaki broke his arm signing books. How many of you couldn't get through the lobby because we had so many people surrounding Guy to get a copy of Enchantment? We ran out of copies, but I believe that you know, there are more in the world. This is the biggest jumpinist expo in the industry. This is all of you having fun, meeting people, learning about possible opportunities for working together. And then we had a party last night right here on the third floor. So I think we had a great day. Thank you all for coming. Right now, this is being live streamed on YouTube. We're grateful to our friends at YouTube. If, you, if you're a Twitter monster and you're busy saying that Brad is saying stupid things on stage, at least say one nice, not smart thing, which is that YouTube, you can see what's going on so your friends can tune in. Today, remember, one of the new things that we launched is our ad tech startup spotlight, and we are absolutely thrilled that it's going to continue today. Uh, so uh, take a look at your program, and you'll see what it is. The Expo Hall opens up again at 10 o'clock in the morning, and uh, it's going to be another fantastic day. We have a program here starting at, in the conference, starting at 10.30. And we have keynote, three mini keynotes at 1 o'clock right here in this room. We have PepsiCo, Bon and Bao from PepsiCo. We have Manny Anacol from Zynga, and John Bax from Living Social three transformative companies that are doing exciting things in digital. Come join us to hear what they're all about. And now, this show is our biggest show. We're, we work hard to make each show better and better, and we're going to be bringing you an even more exciting show in New York, November 8th through 10th, 2011. You can register for the show right now. Go to adtech.com slash New York. There's a hyphen in there. Or you can go to the long URL, but we're excited to say that registration has opened today. So please join us. Everybody out there on YouTube, please sign up right now. We want to see you all in New York in November. And we've had some extraordinarily lucky timing and some exciting news. The IAB uh, expenditure, the earnings report, literally five minutes ago, the con call ended. Randy Rothenberg and the guys at the IAB were generous enough to give me an early look at the numbers. Randy was trying to be here, but he's still on the call. But Randy, so. We had, this is the numbers for 2010, we had a great year. We increased 15% to $26 billion in digital advertising. Let's give yourselves a big round of applause. This industry is growing, our consumer base is growing, and it's getting better and better. Some of the top line numbers, again, up 15% from 2009 to 2010. Fourth quarter revenue, $7.4 $5 billion, up 16% from Q4 2009, up 19% from Q3 2010. Search represented 46% of the revenue. I have no idea why the volume is doing something there, which is a 12% growth uh, in 2010 over 2009. Display grew to $10 billion, up 24% for the year over 2009. And the first year, this is the, there you are, actually, Randy, you're here, stand up. Everybody, let's give Randy Rothenberg, CEO of the IAB, a round of applause. Thank you for coming, and thank you for letting me take a look at these numbers. This is very exciting stuff. The first year that the IAB has tracked mobile ad revenue, and it was between 550 and 650 million dollars. We are doing great stuff. And if you want the full report, go to iab.net slash ad revenue report. And I should give a shout out to PricewaterhouseCoopers, who are the ones who are doing the research with the IAB. So we've had an exciting day yesterday. We're going to have an exciting day 
today, and we're going to have another banner year in 2011. In a few moments, we're going to bring out today's opening keynoter, Ariana Huffington. But first, yesterday morning, you got to see our friend Jeff Ramsey, CEO of eMarketer, uh, receive the Industry Achievement Award. In the afternoon, you got to see Doug Weaver of Upstream Group receive the Industry Achievement Award. You got to see Doug momentarily speechless for perhaps the first time in his life when his wife showed up from Vermont, which he didn't expect. Right now, we're going to have our third winner of the Industry Achievement Award, Carol Walker, the VP of Marketing Communications for Mars Chocolates. To introduce Carol and to give her the award, we're going to welcome a previous recipient of the Industry Achievement Award, Carol Cruz, the head of marketing for ESPN. Please welcome Carol Cruz to the stage. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. Well, it's great to be up here. It was just two years ago that I was receiving this award in a very kind of humbling moment. And I was the first marketer to receive the award. And I thought it's only fitting that for the second marketer to receive the award that I would get to introduce her. And it's even more fun because, of course, it's Carol Walker and Carol Cruz. And back in the day, the early days of the iMedia, there was an article in an industry press, and it was called The Two Carols, you know, driving innovation. And so we had this period of time when it was The Two Carols. We were with big brand companies, and it was about driving innovation. And boy, has Carol Walker been a real driver of change, innovation, and trying new things in this industry. So let me share a few of these with you, and I know you'll agree that she's incredibly deserving of this award. So, um, in 1995, when Carol was at Nabisco, she launched the first online series. I think we called them webisodes then, right? Um, called Parallel Lives. And just to give a little texture to that, that uh, was the same year that Carol had her daughter, Rachel, who is now 16 years old. So one of the first industry first in the webisodes and online branded content. Then when she went to Kraft and was director of digital advertising, Kraft participated in those first XMOS studies. And for those of you who are in the industry, those were cross-media optimization studies that changed how people felt about interactive advertising by shifting money out of traditional, mostly TV, and putting that money into online advertising and proving that you could have positive ROI effects, especially in the consumer packaged goods industry. That work that Kraft did in the XMOS study really opened doors for a lot of consumer goods uh, to get and embrace and move money into the digital arena. And then as another first, back in 2002, it was really only the direct marketers who were using search marketing. But Carol, with the craftfoods.com website, invested heavily in search as one of the first brand companies. And in fact, the, the numbers show how it works so well. From 2002 to 2005, Kraft Foods went from the number seven to the number two recipe website, all with uh, the force of search marketing. And then how many people remember what is um, either brilliant or perhaps crazy when Skittles got rid of their website and directed consumers to Wikipedia Skittles, to Twitter Skittles, to Facebook Skittles? Do you guys all remember that? That was so breakthrough. And some people thought, that Carol and Kraft were crazy to do that, and other people thought they were brilliant. And I would say that um, really put Skittles on the map and overnight received five million fans. So innovation, crazy, both, yes, but hugely successful. And I think that innovation gave all of us uh, permission to think outside that brand box. And then, the recipients of this award are never ones to only focus on their day jobs. And I think what sets people apart in an industry achievement award is what you do outside of your job. What are you doing for the industry? And Carol leads the digital committee at the ANA and is an um, active um, vocal member who's really pushing publishers and advertisers to collaborate more and to share best practices to move the industry forward. And so with that combination of creativity, innovation, trying new things, and leadership in the industry, I am extremely proud to give the 2011 Industry Achievement Award to Carol Walker. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you.
There you go. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. So yes, we were the Carols. Carol from Coke and Carol from Kraft. And um, we're still Carol, but we're not from uh, Coca-Cola or Kraft anymore. So thank you very much. Um, thank you, AdTech. Thank you for uh, those that were behind uh, recognizing me, along with the most incredible um, other two uh, award winners. I'm in awe of, uh, of both Doug Weaver, who I've worked with in the past, and Jeff Ramsey, whose newsletter I receive every day. Amazing, amazing people in the industry. Often the folks like me um, on the advertiser side are behind the scenes, kind of pushing um, and prodding and moving our, our agencies as well as publishers. And um, it, sometimes it's not easy because you are behind the scenes trying to influence and, and mold and shape. But uh, like the other, other folks that came up here this week, I've been asked to talk to what do I love about the industry today. Um, I've been also asked to talk to what excites me about tomorrow. So for me, it's, it's all about the P's, um, the three P's for today. Uh, passion, power, and promise. And it's funny because yesterday, I don't know how many, hopefully all of you were here to see Dr. Uh, Jeffrey Cole talk about um, where we are with the industry today and, and the most recent study. And uh, he talked about power on every single slide. And so you know I went back to my room and thought, geez, so should I rewrite this thing? But no, I mean, to me it is. It's really, it's really about the passion, the power, and the promise. And by the passion, I mean this industry incites the type of passion in all of us, not the least of which is our consumers, right? So it's, a, it's an incredibly passionate industry to be in. It's an incredibly passionate time to be here. And we are often taught that and we tell our children when, when we're passionate about what we do, when we're passionate about how we spend almost every waking hour, um, that can only lead to success. And it's the passion of the people in this room, in this industry, that has really continued to make such incredible inroads in such a short period of time. It's a passion that brings different industries together and different types of people together. Um, what I love is that uh, traditionally you had your, your advertising agency folks and the marketing folks, and they tended to be the kind of the cooler um, part of an organization. And now we've brought together some of the little less cooler folks, the, da the data geeks, the, the computer um, geeks. And I mean, if you think about it, who's really cool today, right? It's these guys. It's, it's the folks that are moving and changing the industry. It's you guys. You're the, you're the, the cool guys today. Um, you're having your moment in the sun, and I love that. So power is another um, aspect that I love, okay? Now, it's not about being a power geek. It's, it's when we can empower others. When, when members, when, when people from developing countries have access to the same type of information that we all have access to, that's incredibly empowering. And it's, it's a force that can change the world. And we see that happening today in the Middle East. So for me, it's, it's, it's not only the power that we have as an industry, but it's the power that it's brought to, to those regular people on a day-to-day -day basis. The power that helps people change the world around them. And I love being part of that. Information is power. That's an old adage. And I've always said that information shared is far, far more powerful. This has always been a collaborative industry. Um, it's one of the things I, I really stress that we should continue to, to be known for is the ability to collaborate across all the different um, types of industries that we represent. Um, and I really, I do, I pray that that will continue. Because shared power leads to greater power. And sharing our brands with consumers empowers both consumers and the brands that increasingly become part of the social fabric of our culture. It empowers consumers to be brand ambassadors or brand detractors. It's empowered regular people like Justin Bieber and Susan Boyle to have the type of success that they could never, ever have even imagined five, six years ago. And what I love about 
putting power in the hands of the people is it requires that marketers respect consumers more than ever before. So what excites me about the future? That would be the promise. Most people that know me would say they were waiting for me to say possibility, but I think it's really, it's, it's stronger than that. It's, it's a promise of, uh, of greater things. It's a promise that, and I know folks can relate to this, that we can expect flawless execution um, when we're about to launch any type of initiative. Uh, it's, it's never fun to go into your president and, and let, let the president of your company know that you've crashed the servers on the, the number one uh, promotion of the year. And so those are the kinds of things that I know this industry is going to, to make good on, is the promise of flawless execution. The promise to uh, continue to elevate the status of women around the world, uh, to bring um, more diversity into, into the industry. I think that the industry is starting to, to get a hold of that, and I, I look forward to that promise. And I really hope that, and the promise of the future is to continue to attract people like you, people that have the passion for the industry, that want to share the power and empower others. Speaking of sharing, I do want to share this award with my friend, my mentor, my former boss, Kathy Reardon. It's without Kathy Elvaney Reardon, without her, her influence, her passion, I would not be standing here right now. Um, so I'm going to share this with Kathy, who, by the way, is not feeling well these days. She's uh, had a, a little bit of a setback. She's on the road to recovery, so her you know, prayers would be more than welcome. But um, I do promise to pay it forward, um, to continue to motivate, to continue to inspire innovation in the industry. And, um, I look forward to working with you all in the future. I do want to thank AdTech again um, and all of you in this room for, for allowing me to continue to um, share my passion for the industry. And um, I hope you'll all stay in the industry for a long, long time. I obviously have. So thank you very much. Congratulations. Oh, thank you very much. Now, oh, there you go. All right, that was wonderful. Um, so now we have uh, our, uh, our keynote speaker, and introducing her is really a challenge. And the reason it's a challenge is that to introduce someone, to describe someone, you have to categorize them. And Ariana Huffington uh, really is uncategorizable. She was a regular guest host, or sorry, co host. She's on a sabbatical right now. One of my favorite uh, NPR radio shows, Left, Right, and Center, she was neither left, right, nor center. Uh, so, uh, and we have here to, with us today someone who's written 13 books on a myriad of topics. She actually will be doing a book signing immediately after uh, her keynote address. She is a remarkable thinker. She founded the Huffington Post. She's going to talk about transformation. And I think that to, to show the kind, again, the kind of uncategorizable thinker she is and why we've invited her to be with us today, when she won a Webby, the, the Webby Awards, you are restricted to five words uh, in your comments when you get the award. And her five words were, I didn't kill newspapers, darling. And so, I can't do better than that. So please, let's give a warm ad tech welcome to Ariana Huffington. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. Thank you so much, Brad. It's great to be here. It's great to be introduced by Brad, because you should never forget that Brad, as well as everything else he is, is a Shakespeare scholar. And I was thinking about that as I was following the conference on Twitter from the East Coast until late last night when I arrived. And I thought the same way that Shakespeare operated within the formal constraints of the Senate, of the sonnet. Today we are all operating within the formal constraints of 140 characters on Twitter. And following the conference on Twitter was absolutely fascinating especially what Guy said about moving from engagement to enchantment. I totally loved that, especially because it fits perfectly as a segue to what I want to talk about today. Uh, it's really my absolute belief that we are moving towards a world 
where increasingly we want to tap into what we call our humanity, uh, the noblest parts of ourselves. And uh, when you look at what is happening, you may think that I'm absolutely making stuff up because there is so much going on that is completely dysfunctional. But in fact, it's almost like watching a split screen. And depending on which part of the screen you're focusing on, you get a very different impression of what is going on in the world. You can focus on one part of the screen, which is all the dysfunctionality going on in Washington, the impossibility of coming up with anything but suboptimal solutions to all our problems. Or you can focus on what is being born, which is really about connecting at a deeper level than ever before. And we see that in cause marketing. I was recently in a hotel room uh, late at night watching uh, TV. And yes, I still do that occasionally. And uh, there was this ad which started with a piano music and a very low male voice that said, millions of people live only for themselves. But is that really the only way? And it went on like that, showing people doing noble things. And it ended up with, guess what? An ad for Shiva's whiskey. <laughs> so I thought to myself, you know, if Shiva's whiskey is using uh, nobility and doing something for others as a way to sell Shiva's whiskey, then clearly, given that marketing and advertising are always leading indicators of what's happening in the culture, there is something going on. And we'd better identify it and tap into it very quickly. And of course, you see this trend towards cause marketing way beyond Shiva's whiskey. Um, you see it in, for example, what B. Stone said when he defined um, Twitter not as the triumph of technology, but as the triumph of humanity. And recently, I was on a panel with Adam Bain, who's been brought in to monetize Twitter. And he said that the three keys to monetization are humor, huge deals, and humanity. And humanity is the key, because if we're actually moving towards an era when humanity is not just good for humanity, but good for the bottom line, something pretty dramatic is happening. And in fact, we see that everywhere. We see it in companies like Western Union that recently had a campaign um, that included a lot of social media to encourage people to tell them where the next Grameen Bank that produces and, and uh, gives macro financing should be set up. And it was a very successful campaign. Of course, Starbucks constantly does that. Uh, Pepsi, Coca-Cola, I don't want to single out brands that may be advertising on AOL Huffington Post soon, but you get the idea. <laughs> Especially since Jeff Levick, the head of our advertising, who is driving cost marketing for us, and Tim Richards, who runs the West Coast, are in the, in the hall. I wouldn't hear the end of it. But my point is that there is something very profound happening. And whenever, as marketers, as media providers, as advertisers, we can tap into the zeitgeist, we have the wind on our back. Now, zeitgeist is an incredibly heavy German word that is untranslatable in English and even in Greek. But it does exist. And it's really about the spirit of the times. And I remember uh, meeting John Assault when I was writing a biography of Picasso in an earlier life. And just before he died, he said to me, we are moving from epoch A to epoch B. And epoch A, he defined as being about survival and competition, and epoch B as being about collaboration and meaning. So if we tap into this large trend that's happening, and in a way, Guy is tapping into that with his book on enchantment, then we are tapping into something very profound. And it doesn't just affect our business, it affects our lives. Now, moving on to the second point, beyond cause marketing and humanity. There is something very connected to that, which is about the fact that we are moving more and more towards local. You know, just as we are hyper-connected on the global level, people are gravitating towards the local level. Because it's not just all politics that is local, or human existence is ultimately local. 
And as things at the national level are increasingly dysfunctional, as I mentioned earlier, people can come to the local level and feel empowered. They can actually get things done. And I see that with Patch. You know, Patch.com is the hyperlocal initiative that I'm now overseeing at AOL. And it's absolutely fascinating. We are in over 800 towns. And it actually brings to life what um, Craig Newmark said, the founder of uh, Craigslist. He said, trust is the new black. And ultimately, people trust what's happening around them in their, no, in their own neighborhood and connect at that level. Especially when the media that we are so used to at the national and global level is so increasingly disconnected from our lives. I don't know how many of you remember, for example, Balloon Boy. It was like endless breaking news coverage on all cable and network news even. And it turned out, first of all, that the balloon boy was really the attic boy. He was never in the balloon. But beyond that, I remember uh, about to go on a television show to talk about Afghanistan. And the anchor said to me, but let's talk about balloon boy first. And I said, why? And the point is that the media has this false sense of sentimentality. Suddenly, you had all these anchors emoting over whether the balloon boy was called in the balloon because the wind was blowing. And I thought to myself, you know, there are hundreds of thousands of little boys in this country who are going to bed hungry, who are going to dysfunctional schools, who could use a little bit of um, emotion and caring from a lot of anchors on our TV shows. And it gave me the idea of maybe creating like a giant balloon and putting some of these hundreds of thousands of little boys in. We wouldn't even have to put them in, actually. We could pretend we put them in <laughs> in order to get a little bit of that attention. So while people are increasingly getting that sense of disconnection from what is being covered by our media, they can go to the local level and connect with what is happening in their communities. That's what we are doing with Patch. And that's really what we see is catching fire. Because you don't just read about your community, you engage with it. And as Will I am, you know, I always like to quote Will I am and Shakespeare in the same speech. <laughs> as Will I am said, in the, in the olden days, like five years ago, we used to consume news sitting on a couch. Today, we consume news galloping on a horse. We don't just consume it, we share it, we pass it on, we add to it, we tweet it. And therefore, doing that at the local level keeps you really connected with your immediate community. And focusing on solutions, that's the other thing that mainstream media have let us down on. There's been so much emphasis on what is not working and very little emphasis on what is working. Uh, at the Huffington Post, um, we, we launched a feature that we called the greatest person of the day. And it was a huge success. You know, every day we get thousands of submissions from around the country, around the world, and we put the spotlight on somebody who is doing good. Now, at the patch level, we're going to launch it as the greatest person of the week in every patch. And it's amazing how people gravitate to solutions when it comes to their own neighborhoods and to getting stuff done. So as we're looking at that, of course, there is nothing new about wanting to fix the world and make the world better. I mean, it, it's an old, an old tendency in human nature. But what's happening today is that the digital reality makes it possible for us to do it obsessively. The main distinction for me between mainstream media and online media, ultimately, as we are more converging towards, in our case, doing more and more original reporting, in the mainstream media's case, doing more and more stuff online. So the main difference is going to be that while mainstream media suffer from ADD, you know, attention deficit disorder, you know, they cover a story and then they abandon it, we suffer from OCD. We cover stories obsessively until there is an impact, until something happens. I mean, just look at our coverage of the foreclosure crisis. It's endless, because the crisis has not ended. And we can cover it in smaller pieces and in shorter pieces and in a constant way that really engages the community. And we can do that 
with even more power at the local level and get everybody engaged in it and in the process occasionally enchanted. So as we are moving into this epoch B that uh, John Salk um, talked about, the, the third thing that I want to talk about is the fact that we are increasingly going to also need to disconnect from our hyper-connected existence. And now that may seem to you like something that doesn't make sense, because you are all hyper-connected. I don't know how many devices you have on you right now, and um, I hope you're not looking at them at all while I'm speaking. Uh, I remember the last time uh, my mother got angry with me before she died. She, um, it was when I was looking at my email and talking to my daughters at the same time, and she looked at me and in her very, very heavy Greek accent, if you think, if you think, I, have an, if you think I have a heavy Greek accent, you have not heard my mother, um, she said to me, I abhor multitasking. <laughs> and I think the truth is that we are all constantly multitasking, and in the process we are missing something. And we are all constantly hyper-connected, and in the process we are missing something. And that's why I think the next big trend that I would want us to bet on here, and those of you who are brilliant at inventing things and new apps and new devices, that's what I would urge you to, to invent next, and I, I give you my patent rights right now in front of everybody. And this is a kind of thing that I would call a GPS for the soul. An app, a device, whatever it can be, that actually shows us how aligned or misaligned we are in our bodies, our minds, and our souls at every moment, and also shows us what we can do to realign ourselves. And I would start with something very simple. I would start with an obsessive emphasis, as we are going to be doing increasingly in our coverage around these issues, on sleep. It may seem very small to you, very irrelevant. You say she's talking about something trivial like sleep. But in fact, the medical evidence is overwhelming that it's essential for our health, for our creativity, for everything you can imagine. And we women will kind of lead the way in this because you guys have kind of defined and equated sleep deprivation with virility. I don't know why, but I recently had a dinner with a guy who said to me and bragged about it that, you know what he said, I just had four hours sleep last night. And I thought to myself, I didn't say it, but I thought to myself, you know what, if you had had five hours sleep, this dinner would have been a lot more interesting. <laughs> so the bottom line is that if we have an incredible plethora, we already have a lot of apps that um, can help you do a yoga class while you're at your desk, or at least in your office. Uh, we already have a lot of apps that have guided meditations or remind you to take some time off during the day. So these things already exist. But imagine if we created a killer app for optimal living. Um, I know that as an, as an editor, I encourage our reporters and our editors in this area of women, of living, of health, to keep focusing on all these ways that we can unplug and recharge, which is the way we call it. Because you know how we never would go to bed unless we're absolutely exhausted or drunk without plugging our devices in you know, at night because we know otherwise they would be dead in the morning? Well, we don't pay the same attention to ourselves. And probably the most profound thing I'm going to say right now is that if there is anybody in this room who goes to sleep with their devices plugged next to their bed, please stop doing that. Because there's a lot of medical evidence. A lot of people are looking at me very guiltily, so I know there are a lot of people doing that. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. But don't do it anymore. Because there's a lot of evidence that if you wake up in the middle of the night, for whatever reason, and you are tempted to uh, check your device, your sleep is not going to be the same after that. It's not going to be as profound, as recharging. And don't you want to wake up feeling recharged and ready to take the world and ready to enchant everyone? It's very hard to enchant people when you're sleep deprived. And if you think that this is um, 
not profound enough. Let me quote Plotinus. You know, is Pro Plotinus profound enough for you? He was a philosopher in the third century, okay? Uh, Will I am Shakespeare and Plotinus, who, who studied the different sources of knowledge, wisdom, and creativity. And he said knowledge has three degrees, opinion, science, and illumination. And the internet actually has contributed much to the first two kinds of knowledge. You know, science in the form of easy access to endless data and information, right? We have no problem with that. And it has also contributed an enormous amount to the second kind of opinion. We have endless reams of opinion on every subject from every quarter, no problem with that. But it has not done a lot about illumination because illumination is ultimately about wisdom. And that's the most profound kind of knowledge. And that's what we are desperately missing at the moment. I mean, just look at the world around us. We are not lacking in IQ, right? There are, there are hundreds of leaders running media companies, running our government, running our financial institutions with very high IQs, having graduated from the best colleges in this country. And they are making dreadful decisions every day. So what they are missing is not IQ or data or information or connectivity. They are missing wisdom. And sometimes I think to myself, you know what? If Lehman Brothers was Lehman Brothers and Sisters, they might still be around. <laughs> I thought, you know, just, I just thought to myself, you know, maybe some sister would wake up after a good eight-hour sleep and... <laughs> look around and see the iceberg about the hit to hit the Titanic. You know, isn't that what leadership is about? While everybody else had missed it. So leadership is about seeing the iceberg before it hits the Titanic. Leadership is about seeing what's around the corner, whether you are inventing something or whether you are avoiding a danger. And in order to get there, we need to actually learn to unplug, recharge, disconnect and reconnect with ourselves. And that, I feel, is going to be one of the greatest trends as I look ahead and look into my crystal ball, which I, look, which I do regularly after a good night's sleep, and, and see what the future is holding for us. And interestingly enough, a lot of that is happening through humor. I mean, one of the reasons why John Stewart and Stephen Colbert have really tapped into the zeitgeist is because they're acknowledging this longing in people to connect with each other at a deeper level. I don't know how many of you went to their Washington rally to restore sanity. Um, in a moment of irrational exuberance, when I was on John Stewart's show just before the rally, I offered um, to take anybody who wanted to go there from New York a ride from New York, right? I did not realize at the time that 10,000 people would sign up. So we ended up having 200 buses leaving from City Field at 5 a.m. for the rally. But when I was there at 5 a.m. welcoming people, um, sleep deprived, I, I realized something very profound, that these people were saying to me, you know, he said, I flew from Minneapolis to take the bus. I flew from Denver to take the bus to go to Washington. And then I met somebody who said to me, I just flew from Washington to take the bus to go to Washington. <laughs> and I thought to myself, you know, this is an act of insanity in the name of restoring sanity. But it showed, again, something very profound, that as we are hyper-connected, we are also longing to connect with each other as human beings. So my other prediction is that while we are going to be seeing a greater and greater explosion of everything digital, we are also going to be seeing a greater explosion of everything live. People will want to connect in their own communities. That's why we are betting on local, because they will want to connect with each other, to see each other, to look into each other's eyes at the same time that they are spending hours and hours on Facebook or tweeting or watching videos on YouTube. I think, in fact, the more we do of the former, the more we will want to connect in a human way, in a live way. So in the same way that everything new has been um, watched with a kind of fear that it will completely replace everything old, 
This is not really what's happening. You know, the movies did not replace television. And the television did not replace radio. We're just connecting with all that in different ways. And that's why I don't see the future as either or. In fact, I don't even see newspapers as dying. I see them as increasingly becoming different and having an active and vibrant online component if they're going to survive. But what is fascinating for me at the journalistic level is how do we learn again to tell stories? You know, how do we go back to the old-fashioned tradition of storytelling? Because so much of our modern media is entirely consumed by data and facts. So I have actually assigned some of our reporters to do nothing else but putting flesh and blood on the stories. So don't tell me that we have 26 million people unemployed or underemployed. Tell me their stories. Tell me what is it really like to graduate from college and not be able to get a job. How do you deal with that? And how do we deal with that as a country? And that's really, what is, that's really the kind of journalism that I think is going to enchant and win hearts and minds in the future and in the present, because we are doing it right now, others are doing it right now, and we see the way that our readers engage with that. Yesterday, we launched um, at um, the Huffington Post Media Group, which includes all AOL content now, um, a big campaign to support military families. And the response has been amazing. We tracked all the different issues that military families are facing. I cannot take my jacket off because I'm wired. <laughs> OK, that's a good idea while it lasted. <laughs> So we saw this amazing response from people wanting to do something for military families. You know, a woman wrote and said, can you connect me with this homeless uh, military vet? I want to offer them a home in Chicago. And really stayed on it until we connected them. And again, in our section called Impact, which is a section we created dedicated to people reading the news, and then taking action to help people or causes that they read about. The most significant shift is that news is now actionable. You know, you used to read something or watch something on TV, and maybe your heart would be touched, and then you'd go and make a cup of tea and forget about it. Now online, you can take action right away. And that's why we have these widgets everywhere that encourage people to take action right away and to be able to do something with their, when their hearts are being touched and activated. So because I want to leave as much time as possible for questions and a discussion, which is the best part for me, um, I would just like to end by saying that if you look at the first 25 years of dot-com, and we've just had the first 25 years of dot-com, it has been like a time of online miracles. I mean, who could have predicted what would have happened in the last 25 years, right? I think we should kind of close our eyes and imagine the world 25 years ago before YouTube, before Twitter, before Facebook, before the Huffington Post. I mean, that's almost impossible to imagine. But, <laughs> but as you look ahead, my crystal ball now sees even more explosive wonder. And the challenge will be to direct that combustible energy and that combustible creativity to solving our needs for more truth, more transparency, more wisdom, more enchantment, and more, much more digital advertising. Thank you. <laughs>
you're talking about solace and sleep, and I imagine your own sleep must have been somewhat impacted by the acquisition. So you're talking about all of these things you need to do to protect yourself. Tell us about your day. What, what are the islands that allow you to do the thinking that you're saying are so important for all of us, and yet at this extraordinarily busy time, I can't imagine that your islands might have been eroded a little bit. So, so what is your day like? So um, in terms of my practical things that I do um, every day, I meditate every day. I try and meditate before I start my day. I have what I call my joy triggers. Now, joy triggers are irrational. You know, my joy triggers may not be your joy triggers. Don't worry about that. Like, my joy triggers involve pictures of my children who are now in college. They are 21 and 19. But I have pictures of them when they were babies and much less problematic. <laughs> and I have them everywhere. And they're a complete joy trigger. Then I have another joy trigger is... Um, a Starbucks um, cappuccino with one shot of espresso only and a, and a green straw. When I look that, somehow it just, it's a complete joy trigger for me. <laughs> the other thing is I always have a, a song on my iPod that is the song of the moment. The moment may last two days, two weeks. I play it nonstop. I don't listen to anything else. It's the joy trigger. At the moment, it's very embarrassing, but I'm going to confess it here, right? The song of the moment is Chris Christopherson, The Taker. I'm sorry. It could have been Mozart, the Zauberflotte, or something, but it's not. I thought it was going to be Will I Am. <laughs> I love Will I Am, too. But it's just, it, there's no reason, there's no rhyme or reason why. But, so at any moment during the day, you can tap into your joy trigger, or tap into your killer app, whatever it is for you, meditation, yoga, whatever, and, and basically course correct. You know, I was talking to a friend of mine who is a pilot, and he said to me that most of the time, planes fly off course. Did you know that? You may be worried now, but the, <laughs> the only reason there aren't any more plane crashes is because they have such a fantastic course correcting mechanism. So a lot of the time, we are off course. We make mistakes constantly. Instead of judging ourselves, we need to have a fantastic course correcting mechanism. Life is all about correcting your mistakes quickly. We, started a, we launched a new section on the Huffington Post just before the merger uh, on divorce. And um, one of the features of the, of the section was something that we called the moment in, we knew. And it became hugely viral. We had people just who would say, the moment I knew, basically, that this was over, or the, minute, the moment I knew she was having an affair, or the moment I knew, whatever. It was just incredible. And incidentally, the idea of the divorce section was Nora Ephron, who is an editor at large with us, and she said, we must launch a section on divorce, because she said, marriage comes and goes, but divorce is forever. <laughs> And that became our tagline. <laughs> so, I mean, basically, humor and joy triggers and something that provides course correcting are my keys to um, be able to do my life at a more intense level uh, since the, the integration has definitely uh, meant um, just a lot of work, a lot of uh, time spent bringing together two companies. It's, it's worked kind of amazingly, given that normally um, integrations are really hard. I think part of it has been because, you know, our CEO, Tim Armstrong, was determined that we would do it really fast. So when the facilities people said to him, we can move everybody in the same office by the end of May, he said, pretend you're having a party, not an integration of two companies. Prefer, pretend your daughter is getting married. You have to do it by the end of March, and we did. And um, the day that the merger became legal, we also launched um, a 30-day volunteer effort for all the employees. And every office around the world that completed 100% participation would get Greek cookies and champagne, and Boston was first. So again, as a company, one of the things that has been so amazing for me about this merger is that our goals are so aligned that what Tim wanted to do for AOL and what I wanted to do for the Huffington Post in terms of bringing us together and actually living all the things we are talking about, living our commitment to doing something good while at the same time doing 
well for the bottom line and for the company need to permeate everything. And that's why we brought B. Stone as our strategic advisor for social impact to work with him in identifying all the ways that we as a company can actually practice that and at the same time put a spotlight on what other companies are doing around the world um, that have to do with corporate responsibility and have to do with doing well by doing good. All right. We have a question. Tell us who you are. Hi, Ariana. My name is Christian Grant from uh, Executive Talks. Um, you're not always politically correct, and sometimes you say things that um, people in Washington or journal journalists normally don't say. Where do you get all that courage from to say what you really feel? Well, I remember uh, when I was growing up in Greece and I'm uh, studying, <laughs> studying uh, Socrates. My God, I, I don't normally quote so many dead wise people, but um, Socrates said that um, Courage is the knowledge of what is not to be feared. Most of the time, we are afraid of our own shadows. Most of the time, we're afraid of things that do not deserve to be afraid of. And I think that's really, for me, the most important thing. And I wrote a book called uh, On Becoming Fearless. And that's not really about being fearless in the sense of not being genuinely afraid, but it means not letting our fears get in the way of us doing or saying what we want to do, including taking risks. I mean, those of you working in this digital sphere take risks all the time because we are kind of reinventing the world all the time, and there are never any guarantees. I remember when we launched the Huffington Post, you know, the overwhelming assumption was that it would be a complete failure. Indeed, Nikki Fink wrote about it on the first day. She called it the movie, I've, I've learned the, the review by heart. She said, the Huffington Post is the movie equivalent of Gili, Heaven's Gate, and some other dreadful movie, all rolled into one. And then she said, this failure is simply unsurvivable. So you have to be willing to not let um, reviews like that or uh, naysayers get in the way of what you want to do. And as I tell my daughters endlessly, uh, you have to also be willing to fail along the way. Um, I constantly talk to them about my failures. I constantly say to them, for example, my second book was rejected by 36 publishers. You know, at some point, maybe at rejection number 25, I might have said, you know what? This is really the wrong job for me. I should do something else. So that's when you really, if you believe in something, perseverance is for me the key between failure and success. And, and also is the key to um, not being afraid uh, about what people say about you or how people perceive you because that's really the, the road to inaction. We have a question over here. Please tell us who you are. Sure. Hi, Ariana. Ariana. I'm, I'm Mike Boland. I'm an analyst with BIA Kelsey and a writer, and I'm actually one of your bloggers for HuffPost, so thank you for that. So people often ask me along those lines, you know, do you get paid for that? And my answer is no, but, you know, it's exposure to 40 million uniques or, you know, some, something like that, um, which is better than a paycheck. So that's usually my answer to that question. I'm wondering what your answer is to some of the criticism that, you know, in not my words, but in the words of the criticizers, you are kind of exploiting some of these voices. Um, and, you know, what's your answer to that? And then also, how does that feed into your general strategy in terms of building an editorial product around many different breadth, a breadth of voices from industry? Well, actually, I'm so glad you, you brought that up because uh, for me, blogging, which has been a very important part of the Huffington Post from day one, and will continue to be. In fact, we are migrating the blogging platform of the Huffington Post on all AOL sites and on all patches. You know, all 800 towns will now have a blogging platform, which I think will increase engagement dramatically because you'll be able to have anybody from the mayor to the kid that's participating in a high school game be able to blog, to upload pictures, um, video, whatever and the commenting platform, which goes along with blogging. And last month alone, we had 4 million comments. So we're migrating all that. That is like in its own bucket. That's really what the internet is about. That's what people do all the time, whether it's on Facebook, on their own blogs, on collective blogs, on Yelp, um, on Google, 
on any form of social media. People are blogging, and they're blogging because they want more and more people to be exposed to their ideas, their opinions, their books, their movies, either because they are selling something or because they believe in something that they want to share with others. And that's the brave new world. And there are no commitments. Like, if, I'm delighted you blogged for us, but if, say, you decided not to blog, nobody would bug you. And there are no deadlines. And then there is the other world of journalism. And we have hundreds of paid, with full benefits, etc., reporters and writers and editors. Uh, who are in a way, as Jason Lincoln, some media editor, wrote in a piece, providing the architecture, and pro building it, if you want, building the field into which bloggers can come and have it all ready for them, the great technology, the great pre-moderation technology also, which means that when you blog, if somebody wants to attack you um, and use sort of vile language or ad hominem attacks, we're not going to let the comment through. So there will be also a similar environment in which the conversation can take place. But all that could not happen without all the paid people creating that architecture. So there's two very different worlds. Aggregation is a third bucket. And uh, we were, Tim Armstrong and I had an all hands meeting at our office in, in Washington, in Dallas, Washington. I always say Washington also because otherwise people think I'm saying Dallas, Texas, you know, one of the problems with my accent. So, um, and uh, during that meeting, I actually said that even if Tim Armstrong had suddenly said to me, you know what, you have $10 billion to produce original reporting, I would still aggregate. Because I believe that even if I had unlimited amounts of money to produce original reporting, I could not claim that we are the only source of good reporting and good writing. And I, wa I would want our readers, and now unduplicated, we have 250 million unique visitors around the world, I would like them to come to us and know that they are going to have access to the best writing, the best news, the best information, the best services around the world, either that we produced or that we curated for you. And that's a great service. And so for me, these are different buckets. And the best media companies of the 21st century are going to excel in all these three areas. And the fourth one being engagement through commenting. We have time for one more question. Please tell us who you are. Hi, Ariana. My name is Nick Wasoki. Uh, I was actually recently laid off from a tech company here in San Francisco. But, so I'm available if you have any opportunities. But I digress. Um, uh, Ariana at HuffingtonPost.com is my email. Perfect. I'll shoot you an email. Um, I'm, I'm actually curious. I'm, I'm very interested in your idea that, and I couldn't agree more, that people are very sleep deprived and everybody's so connected. I'm curious what evidence you have, other than the medical researchers saying that it's not a good idea, what evidence do you have that this is a trend that's going to begin to reverse itself? Because from what I see with Google and their Droid and, and Apple and their iPod and their, and their iPads and all this, people are becoming more and more connected and maybe even sleeping less. So what, do you, what makes you believe that this trend is going to begin to reverse itself? Thanks. Well. That's a great question to end on because it really sums up everything that I talked about, which is that whether you're optimistic about the future or pessimistic depends entirely at what part of the split screen you're looking at. Um, because we're living in such an amazing time of transition, and I know that in a sense everybody always thinks they're living in a time of transition. Apparently, Adam turned to Eve and said, darling, we're living in a time of transition. Uh, but I think now we are really living in a time of transition. And so if you look at what is dying, you're going to be incredibly depressed about our world. Actually, on the days when I'm focusing on what is dying, either because I'm writing about it or because I'm editing somebody's piece about it, I want to literally crawl in my bed under the covers and not get out of bed. But when you then switch and look at the other part of the split screen at what is being born, you're just filled with this incredible sense of optimism about what's happening in the world. And whether it's at the political level or at the personal level, whether it's about sleep and learning to lead lives that are not about exhaustion, that are not about the idea that success means driving yourself into the ground and having a heart attack in your 50s, otherwise you can't succeed, then 
you are seeing a whole other world being born. And I know at the political level, I, I, my last book was called Third World America. So that's a pretty depressing title. And the first 199 pages are all about what is dying. They're all about the downward mobility in this country. They're all about the indicators of the American dream dying. So I recommend that you skip these 199 pages <laughs> and start on page 199, which is about what is working in this country, about the ways that people are coming together using social media to help themselves and help each other. Just, just one example. Um, in um, Portland, Oregon, an unemployed man, an unemployed concierge who had exhausted all possibilities of finding another job after he had filled in hundreds of applications, came to the conclusion that the one thing he had was time. So he started a site called We've Got Time to Help .org, and he literally connected people who are unemployed or underemployed with people of need, and it transformed not just the lives of people that they touched, but their own lives, because suddenly, instead of seeing themselves as victims, they began to see themselves as people who could help others. And that dramatically changes the way you look at yourself. And I have endless examples of what's happening. And the use of social media for that, whether it's Etsy.com, where people just go and create their own jobs. They take their hobbies and turn them into jobs. Or any number of sites. I mean, I've spent so much time on sites like RecessionWire.com, on HowIGotLaidOff.com. You're not depressed at the end of it because you're like stunned by the explosion of compassion, creativity, and ingenuity that human beings are capable of, and that now the new technologies make it possible for us to connect with each other and to make it easier to get to a, a tipping point where that part of the split screen begins to take over the other part of the split screen. So maybe it's because I'm Greek, and a naturalized American, but I am a congenital optimist. You know, after all, Zorba the Greek is a cultural hero, and, um, and America is a congenitally optimistic nation. So I do believe that if we use the incredible miracles of technology to make it even easier to tap into our own humanity, we will be able to transform the world in all the ways that we're all dreaming of. Thank you so much. What a wonderful way to end. Thank you, Ariana Huffington. <laughs> Ariana is going to have a book signing downstairs on level two. The expo floor is open. We have sessions beginning at 10.30. Thank you for coming, and we'll see you here at 1 o'clock. <laughs>